are passionate about our role in fueling resource prosperity. And that includes helping organizations become sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and focused on impact. At KPMG, we're trying to live those um, ideals, so I'm pleased to say that we've started on that impact journey in measuring our sort of progress and our inaugural impact report is available on our website, should anyone be interested. Uh, but today's not about KPMG, it's about uh, Voices of Aotearoa. So uh, I'm pleased to introduce Barry Coates, who will be known to most of you. Barry is the CEO and founder of Mindful Money. Uh, Barry has worked in the investment community and in sustainability networks, so it's, you know, it's a too long a list for me to cover today, as well as representing uh, New Zealand in, in our parliament. Uh, Barry is a member of the expert technical working group of the Sustainable Finance Forum, which is part of the Aotearoa uh, Circle. Uh, so before I just hand over to Barry, just a couple of housekeeping matters. If there is an emergency, so if the fire alarm rings, please congregate outside, out through the main entrance, uh, just by Fentroth Street. Uh, if you're looking for the toilets, they're outside, so go left, up the landing, and you should be able to find them. So without much further ado, I'll just introduce Barry to kick us off. Kia ora nā mihi nui ki e koto ka Barry Coates ahu ka pei kārahi o te patea fai fakaro. Nā reira, tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā tato kato. So great to see you all. Thank you very much for for coming. Uh, I'm Barry Coates, as, as Dashana said. Uh, I'm CEO and, and founder of Mindful Money. Uh, we are here today to talk about the uh, 2023. Uh, report, the annual survey uh, of the New Zealand public on ethical and impact investing. This is a joint collaboration between Mindful Money and RIA, and we have been doing this for five glorious years. Uh, and uh, thank you personally hugely to RIA for, for being a partner in this, uh, in this enterprise. It's, uh, it's great to be, to be working with you guys. Uh, and warm welcome to Dean, who's going to talk after me, but also Simon O'Connor, the CEO of, of RIA, is, is here joining us from Australia. So welcome, Simon. Uh, a big thank you before I start to, uh, to KPMT for hosting us, to, uh, for, for that welcome. Thank you very much, Dashana. That was uh, uh, very gracious, and, and uh, uh, we, uh, we're pleased to, to be here, and uh, uh, we much appreciate the... Uh, uh, the support from KPMG for, for this kind of uh, work. Um, so we're talking about this study, um, and I'm going to run through a presentation, uh, and the slides are going to automatically switch over, uh, so I shall uh, <laughs> keep on talking until they do. Um, so th again, the background is this is a, uh, a representative survey, so a 1,000 people across the New Zealand public high levels of, of, uh, uh, of significance from the survey. Uh, it's rep it's represented, representative across, uh, uh, across uh, uh, gender, across region, across age groups. Yeah. We're presenting some of the data some like this, this uh, in uh, disaggregated in form. Disaggregated so form. So, so let's start on, let's on start this on one. This tends to be our bellwether kind of measure. So what do people think about the expectations on their on their fund providers, whether it's KiwiSaver or retail investment funds, as you can see from this, it varies a bit by by age group. And the headline figure is around three quarters, so actually seventy four percent this year. That's remained pretty stable, and uh, um, that's significant to us this year because it's all very well for people to want ethical investing when markets are going up. It's a different thing when markets are going down. And so we were kind of a little bit nervous and, and looking forward to the survey results and thinking, oh, what's going to happen here? You know, are we actually going to be in a position where people will say, no, actually, we don't really care about ethical investing anymore. We just want financial returns. But actually, this data says that, that people are solid on still expecting their providers uh, to be investing ethically. 
And as you can see in terms of, of uh, age groups, it skews younger. Uh, we find that in much of the data that you will see. It also skews strongly towards women. Uh, and um, we don't do that in order to typecast women in any particular category or, or, uh, or preference. It's data and it tells us that there, there is strong support uh, for this agenda from, from women, a little less so from men and particularly less so from older men. So, so there's really interesting levels of disaggregation of this data uh, and uh, I encourage you to read the full report and uh, see some of the information behind, behind this. So next slide is uh, uh, the implications of what happens if, if uh, fund providers don't invest ethically according to the preferences of consumers. Now, uh, this sort of proportion of New Zealanders willing to actually switch their accounts has gone up and uh, it is still lower than Australian data, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's kind of getting, uh, getting up there and uh, uh, we see evidence of that in terms of, of the Mind for Money website of people coming onto the website seeing what's in their portfolio and saying, well, actually, I didn't sign up to that. I want something with higher ethical standards. So, so we see that happening all the time, and it's reflected uh, in the data. Uh, again, uh, skewed, uh, in this case, a little bit more towards millennials, but actually quite even across other age categories. So... One of the interesting things from, from the survey that we found uh, is the expectations around returns. Now, many of you know that there's lots of evidence around there uh, um, in terms of meta-analyses of ethical investment over the past couple of decades, and generally what it says is that ethical funds perform at least as well, if not better. So it skews on the better side of at least as well, uh, than conventional funds. And RIA's analysis of the Australasian market uh, uh, shows that Mindful Money's own data on mindful funds versus non-mindful funds shows it for the New Zealand market. So it's a pretty strong conclusion and, and uh, you can also see anecdotally uh, performance of some of the fund managers with strong ethical principles to see that they're also performing very well. But what we're quite pleased about is seeing the public recognising that and understanding that and coming to their own views around that. So, so this, is, uh, this is a strong result and as you can see, it's significantly stronger in 2023 than, than last year. So, so that 15% uh, who strongly agree is, is a big step from, from last year. Um, the other thing is there's this kind of good news around, around ethical investing that, that, as I said, you know, it's pretty rock solid even when markets are going down. When you ask the question about do people intend to invest ethically and find an ethical fund in future, um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's strong within the next five years, and the number of people who say that they're never going to choose one keeps on falling year to year. But what's increasingly kind of important if you take out the number who say that they're already doing this, then actually a big proportion of the remainder are saying that they will be looking <coughs> to find an ethical fund. As we all know, what people say in surveys is not always their observed behaviour in the market, but that's a very strong indication of ongoing support uh, and continuing growth and demand for ethical investing in the future. So, um, on to consumer preferences. We asked about barriers to shifting uh, into ethical investing. And as you can see, the top barrier, I don't have the time to compare the options and do the research, is again uh, the top barrier, and it has been. So, both RIA and Mindful Money are kind of in the business of trying to make that a little bit more obvious. But in the report, we also... Uh, give a challenge in a way to, to the government, to the regulator, to say it would be really helpful to have some standardised data around reporting 
on ethical issues. We have a huge number of measures uh, in fund updates around financial information that fund managers are required to provide. There is virtually nothing on required measures on ethical investing. And it would be good to see the kind of, of information that would help the public be able to make comparisons based on standardised measures that they can make when they're looking at financial returns or fees or other information. But at the moment, that's not available on ethical investing and in a way, we are a mindful money and, and one or two others are trying to fill in some of those gaps, but really it should be part of the regulatory uh, framework. Can we move to the next one? Um, this is uh, a, a, a kind of an off-sited piece, and this is kind of perhaps the starting point for many investors. Um, the New Zealand investors still, as a whole, want to avoid stuff that they disagree with, that are inconsistent with their values. And that's a characteristic of many, of many consumers. Um, from the fund management point of view, many fund managers would rather say, well, actually that's not as important as stewardship and engagement, but it's a reality for, for, for many consumers. And these are the issues uh, that consumers are concerned about. Up, up the top are human rights violations, labour rights abuses, environmental damage, violations of the rights of indigenous people, and interestingly, companies that don't pay their fair share of tax. Um, I would say those five categories are exactly the same five categories as they were last year, in the same ranking, and the percentage scores are exactly the same as last year. And what we've found over five years is this has hardly changed. It's amazingly stable across different data providers. So uh, call out to Dynato, who, who has done the market research for us on this study. Previously, a different data provider came up with essentially exactly the same percentages, or very close to it. We see one or two changes, so fossil fuels is coming up the list over time. Uh, some of the so-called sin stocks or social harm stocks, so tobacco, alcohol, gambling, pornography, tend, tend to be um, going down the list a bit, comparatively. Uh, and certainly animal welfare issues are, are, are right up there as well as human rights issues. So that's, uh, that, that's a kind of, in a way, that's really useful information for fund managers, I think, to know, particularly in New Zealand, as there is generally a tendency for many fund managers to say, OK, we exclude tobacco and we exclude controversial weapons and that's it. And actually what this data shows is that a substantial majority of people in each of these categories would prefer not to invest in a whole lot of other things as well. So next slide. Um, and finally, uh, uh, the, the expectations on, on climate change. This is again where there's been some change. So 3% so increase in people who understand that their financial decisions can impact on climate change. And the question, I mean, the question for me is not why 45% in terms of it being a big number, but why it's so low. Because actually fund managers can do a lot in terms of influencing uh, carbon emissions in the real world as a result of their investment policies. Uh, and what we're not seeing yet is um, the public really understanding that in a, in a deep level. And I think that's, uh, that's a work on for all of us involved in education uh, of the public to actually help them understand that, you know, Reducing climate emissions is not just something you, you do by not driving your car or eating less meat or, or switching off light bulbs. Actually, it's also about your financial decisions. And, and I think this is starting to be reflected in policies of fund managers, helped, of course, with climate disclosure regime coming in. But actually, it would be good to see that conversation go so much further, uh, including from the consumer perspective. So that's it. Let me pass over to uh, Dean, and uh, 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 we're very happy to have, again, the, the collaboration with RIA. Uh, Dean Hegarty is, is New Zealand manager for, for RIA, 
Uh, warm welcome to you, Dean. Kia ora. Thank you, Barry. Uh, good morning, everyone, again. Uh, thank you, Barry, and thank you to the Mindful Money team for the incredible work uh, that has gone into compiling the survey. So I'll pile on in terms of um, the results and the findings because where I think we really want to um, move to next, looking at authenticity and, and to a, a degree transparency, one of the key areas within the industry um, that we're really starting to look at now is greenwashing. Um, there's a really good reason for that. I think anybody who's um, had an eye cast across the Tasman from a regulatory perspective has seen a lot of um, actions starting to come out, um, both on, in, uh, in New Zealand and Australia. We've seen um, a lot of guidance being issued by the FMA and, and ASIC across the Tasman. ASIC have now already started to come and, um, and actually issue um, some warnings and, and some fines and, um, and consequences to some challenges. So it's an area that's of relevance to everybody in the room. Um, but what this survey finds, uh, what the what respondents tell us. making sustainability claims, 49% of customers are worried that you are not telling the truth about that. Okay, and while there's, yes, there's some nuance in, um, in the age bracket, millennials far more likely to be sceptical, as are those who have got a university education, or interestingly, those who have really low uh, KiwiSaver balances. Um, the reality is that with 50% of um, of the general public being concerned about the claims that we are making when we talk about sustainability, we're going to need to get better at articulating them and proving them and actually demonstrating why they are true. Also, within this question, sorry if we can just skip back. So, back one more. So, this kind of moves on to the second piece, um, which is third party verification. And um, really underlines just how important having that independent verification is when you have products in the market and you are making claims. So 59% of consumers are more likely to invest in an ethical fund if they see that fund has been verified by an independent third party. Um, again, what I think is really interesting is that millennials who are much more skeptical about the claims you are making are also much more likely to rely on the third party verification that you might be getting. So it's interesting that there's that direct translation to skepticism, but that at the end of the day, if once they do some due diligence, and in this instance, I guess the due diligence is verification, they then are more likely to be comfortable about investing in your products. As you know, RIA are the, uh, are the verifier in the Australian New Zealand market, and I think it's really interesting that this, this number persists, but particularly within the New Zealand landscape, it really does reflect and translate the work that we've seen within the industry. So uh, New Zealand members make up, just for context, New Zealand members make up about 15% of RIA's member base, but New Zealand fund managers make up 40% of the certified products that are in the market on both sides of the Tasman. So just a, a stat that that outweighing really does outline just how important in the New Zealand market that third party verification is. Moving on to the next slide. Um, and again, I think this one really speaks to disclosure and engagement in the sense that what it's really telling us is that actually customers want to know about their products. They want to understand what they're investing in uh, and they want you to be able to clearly articulate to them what that is. And this manifests itself um, by presenting that, um, I think it's 60, what, 64, 66% of consumers actually want you to be able to tell them what products and what companies are in the portfolios that they are invested in. Uh, and I think for those fund managers and, um, and even those advisors in the room, uh, you know, it's a question for you. Are you delivering that information to the degree that your customers are going to be comfortable with? Um, is it just top line? How much detail have you got in that? Is something that I would encourage you to have a bit of a look at. Moving on to the next. And, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. So, financial advisors, and I think there's some really good news and some really bad news for financial advisors, depending on the way you look at this. 
without, um, without breaking it down, the reality is that if you're working in financial advice, your customers expect more of you than they used to. Um, and that that's a trend that is probably going to continue. And so within a context of that, and if you look at a couple of those really important numbers, they 56% expect you to know about responsible investment options. Uh, and just under half actually expect that you're going to ask them about their values when you are doing your client discovery. So forget about your requirements and, um, and what is best practice. Your customers actually expect this of you. How are you going to make time and energy to do that when there's so many other expectations that are on you through this process as well? It's something that I think we really need to start focusing on and thinking about. And then if you're a fund manager who's working with financial advisors and using them as a distribution channel, uh, I would encourage you to understand that advisors are smashed with expectations. So if you want them to understand your products and you want them to understand how they're different uh, and what the important sustainable elements of the funds are, you need to make it really clear and really easy for them to pick that information up. Because otherwise, it's going to be hard for them when they're drowning in a sea of expectation that is only going to continue to increase. And so the next piece, uh, and we can probably just skip to the next slide, really exciting uh, piece to the puzzle, I think, and, and a big development within the New Zealand landscape as we look at the importance that my ethical or responsible investments actually make a positive difference in the world. If you're running an ethical fund, if you are making ethical claims, your customers don't just expect that their money's not doing bad stuff, they also expect that it's going to start to do good stuff. Um, and just as critically, they actually want you to tell them what that good stuff is. They need you to be able to articulate it and they expect you to be able to articulate it. And I think the reason why that's really important is particularly if we look at fund management in New Zealand, and there's been a huge amount of work over the last 12 months and stewardship code and a lot of really high quality engagement practices have improved. A lot of reporting is coming out of TCFD and the stewardship code and all of that work. Traditionally, those stories are harder to tell customers than exclusion stories. There's no question about that. So we're going to need to get better and focus on how we're able to really clearly and articulate, uh, articulately, it's a funny word to stumble on, um, how we tell that story to our customers so that they can receive it really clearly and that they're going to have the trust that when we talk about an ethical product, and when they invest in our ethical product, that that is what they believe it is. And to do that, we're going to need to be able to quantify and tell them about the positive impacts that our funds are having. And, and, I, and that's a really important development um, that hopefully continues into the future. And I guess in a lot of instances it's always important to sort of stop and ask why. Like why does all of this matter? And I think this slide is, is really critical for a couple of reasons. One is that 80% have effectively said that, they've, that they're perfectly happy to invest their money in an ethical fund. Uh, yes, there's provisos around returns. We've already seen that the expectations on returns from ethical funds are there amongst the general public. So this is where the market now lives. It's 80% of the population, and I think in terms of opportunity, that really does speak for itself. What is also really interesting is that 20% as a laggard group is actually pretty significant. So the fact that 20% of people say, actually, I don't care about returns, I don't care about impact, um, I simply don't believe in ethical or sustainable investing. Um, while it's a small group, and while I think the 80% number is important, that's still one in five people in the population. And so it's still a group that I think we will need to shift and we need to be conscious that those people exist within the market. Uh, moving on to the, um, the issues. And again, while you could highlight little individ uh, individual pieces and, and nuance, the reality that this slide tells us is that people are more interested in the positive outcomes that their funds are investing in. There's just about double-digit growth in every single category that we ask people on um, from last year to this year. 
And I'd point out that since we did this survey, there's been some really major weather events that have only increased the likelihood, in my opinion, that people would have an interest in where their investments are sitting. So um, I think it's just, this is a really good barometer to me that, yes, there's all this data that things are moving, and yes, there's a lot of great results and feedback that's coming out of this. Double-digit growth in every single category shows that we're actually moving, consumer sentiment is moving, but it's moving really, really quickly. And if we can maintain this momentum, um, then we're going to see a lot of positive outcomes into the future. Final slides. Uh, and I think at a macro level, this one's just a really interesting one. You know, the reality is we have a KiwiSaver scheme in New Zealand because we want people to save for their retirement and to have a long-term savings scheme. What this slide, and again, it's incredibly consistent, um, is that what this shows us is that when people believe that their investments are going towards good, they are more likely to save more money. That's why we have schemes set up the way we do. There's no end of data and research and positive outcomes from people having high volumes of long-term savings. And so the more we can draw the link between the positive outcomes that are coming from these products uh, and, the, um, and how they can lead to a long-term sustainable future for customers, the more likely, our, particularly our younger generations, are going to save for their future, and that's a really important piece as we look at an ageing population and all those challenges that everybody knows about. So I think, I'm pretty sure that's the last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Perfect. Uh, that brings us to the end of, uh, of the presentation and the slides. I'll now uh, happily hand over to Kirsten, uh, Kirsten Lapham from KPMG to get the panel started. Kirsten, welcome. I'm delighted to be facilitating the conversation today on a topic that is so top of mind for this industry. Um, I'm going to present the other uh, couple of people on our panel today. Uh, so we have um, John Barry, who joins from uh, Pathfinder Asset Management, which pursues ethical um, investment strategies, um, has a number of accolades, including um, Best uh, Ethical Kiwi Saver by um, Mindful Money. Um, and also joining us via weblink is uh, Leah Willis, who joins us from Australia Ethical. Um, and a, a nod to perhaps sustainability is uh, joining rather than travelling over from Australia. So welcome to Leah. Um, at the end of this discussion, hopefully I'm keeping track of all the questions here, um, feeding in from the survey that I read, but we'll hopefully have some time for extra questions at the end. Um, and those joining us on weblink um, via the, uh, there will be a chat uh, link there for you to enter in your questions, which will be answered directly that way. Um, so back to our panel. Um, I thought that was really interesting um, to hear some of those themes that came out of there. And I think a good way to open up the discussion is um, just a general question to perhaps Leah and John. And we might start with you, John. Um, did you... What did you find, if, if you did, anything sort of surprising from those results or, or interesting? What, just a general question there. General question. Um, I thought there's lots of interesting data. Sorry, is this mic on? Um, lots of interesting data on there around the growth of um, get the investment. And, you know, for the last decade, we've been hearing what a fad this is. Um, it's going to burn out. People don't lose interest. But it's absolutely um, got one into mind it, and it's taking a greater and greater share of the market. Also, you know, thank you. Yeah, there you go. Give this one a go. Yes. Um, I thought it interesting as well, Barry's observation around looking at exclusions and what people raise exclusions. You've seen alcohol, tobacco, and gambling are three of the bottom four exclusions people expect. I would say that is because they take it for granted you actually don't exclude those at the moment. Human rights, environmental issues, animal welfare, um, factory farming, um, moving right up the top of the what people are starting to focus on. So, you know, Great, thank you. And Leah, how about you? Yeah, thank you. Um, look, there's a, there's a couple of things I'll go through saying in a bit more detail, but I think the, the I mean, it's, it's not surprising that the numbers are, numbers are quite similar to the Australian market. So, we see about 75% of consumers here. Are, in, are either investing in ESG already or interested and, and considering switching um, in the next 12 months. So 
um, that sort of uh, meets with that and also the consumer expectations around advisors um, and I'll talk to that a little bit more later on but um, definitely advisors having to come up the curve and, and respond to that demand. Um, I guess the surprising thing when I was talking to, to is the complexity of ethical issues. I was really intrigued, impressed uh, um, by that list. In Australia, it tends to be shorter and it tends to be um, very much around climate, carbon emissions, um, environment, um, but some really, some really interesting and complex ethical issues that New Zealanders are obviously really interested in. Thanks, Leah. That's um, helpful. So, talking about switching, um, that's sort of one at least one, one, one of my first, first, my first questions, um, again, questions to you, John. again to you, John. Um, um, Obviously, more and more people are attracted to the court, and that's emerged from these survey results. But we still have this issue where it seems that there's a hesitancy to switch. Um, and I just wondered what you think some of those perceived barriers are to, to switching um, from your perspective. Cool, thanks. Um, Barry, in his, in his talk, identified nine reasons why there are barriers that gives you a zero to barriers to switching. Um, when I look at that, I break those nine barriers down into two categories. And the first category is essentially um, scarcity of reliable information for consumers. So if you look forward to the top five reasons, not enough independent information, I don't believe the information providers are giving me, I don't know who to ask, I don't have time to go through the information in here. Those are all about the availability of information you know, from peer providers. And the you know, insight or what I get from that is that as an industry, we need to spend time and energy encouraging um, the independent providers and of transparency and certifications um, to expand it and have greater reach for consumers. And that's not an investment for my money and um, for Ria, but that's just the reality. Um, I think Dave is telling us we need to get roles and we need to grow. So the, that was five of the nine reasons for barriers. The remaining five reasons in that, in that category are actually question the um, perception versus reality that consumers are experiencing. So if you look at the other five reasons, it's too hard to switch. No, it's not. It takes two minutes online. It's super easy. Um, it will cost you more. No, it won't. If you look at um, managed funds in the ethical space, they cost the same as managed funds. They don't want to be ethical. Um, lack of options. No. If you go into Kiwi Safe with 35 buyers, there are 35 different approaches to ethical responsible investing that go right across the spectrum. So the options are there. There's no point. Um, I don't have much money. I disagree. I'd say Kiwi Safe is $90 billion in Kiwi Safe as a whether you've got thousand dollars in Kiwi Saver or hundred thousand dollars in Kiwi Saver, I don't think it matters. I think New Zealand should be approaching this as a collectively and saying, how do we want our money invested? How do we want that ninety million dollars to drive change in the world? So I don't accept that not having enough money in Kiwi Saver is a reason not to um, consider it. And the last reason is um, ethical investment doesn't make a difference in the real world. Again, I disagree. I would say this for the evidence it does make a difference. Um, but thankfully, that's actually the least rated barrier for. Switching. You know, from that category, um, you know, these reasons for consumers, I would know, my insight to that is that consumers blame ourselves. Like, that's our responsibility as an industry to raise awareness and education for people to understand the ethical investing better. Um, there are obviously barriers there. It's on us, not consumers, to, to overcome those um, and to overcome the barriers. Thanks. Thanks, John. Uh, must have a background in sales there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, great. Um, this kind of links to my next question, actually, um, from the survey, Dean, um, when we're looking at um, the the results. And I wonder if you thought it was concerning, or what do you what do you say to the fact that it's, it um, revealed that 13% are choosing a Kiwi Saver that aligns with their um, values or has the best sustainability, but the same amount is also um, concerned with um, financial. Um, gains as well, so that sort of balances it. And then again, it um, it seems like half of those people are sticking to their existing providers, the devo default providers. So are we sure people are not just kind of doing whatever's easier rather than really yeah. focusing on these issues? And I might, if I can, just jump back to John's point just quickly because I think as much as you know, I think so the, the greenwashing example. Here we go. Um, like, I think when we, when we looked at the greenwashing example, um, you know, it really was, I guess, looked as a bit of a wake-up call for some of the fund managers. I think some of those stats for us is, you know, an industry body and as a verifier are a bit of a wake-up call as well, for sure. Like, we, yes, we need help from the industry. Yes, 
um, we need people to support us and people like Mindful Money need support to be able to get the message out. But we are, you know, I know that RIA is an organisation, um, I know a lot of what Mindful Money do as well. We spend a huge amount of time analysing products, and I know there's many fund managers in the room who have had their funds uh, analysed. You know, it can be an exhaustive, extensive process. We're doing the work to get that information. And so I think it is, how do we make it really digestible to consumers is a big, you know, something we need to figure out because it is there and the fact that people are still identifying it as a barrier, um, it means that we're not quite doing as good a job as we'd like to do. Um, in answer to your question, I think it's a tricky one. I, when, we ask, when we ask that question, I think it's a real either or question about, you know, why. And I think it's, you know, particularly when you look at, um, at the banks and at the default providers, I think you know, there's every reason to believe that um, that when I'm allocated to a funding, uh, to a default provider, for example, that's been through a government process, that I would believe that that is in the best, in my best financial interest anyway. Likewise with my bank. Um, I think probably what it speaks to to me a little bit as well is, you know, we saw that stat before that 59% um, of of consumers are more likely to believe the claims of a fund that have been independently verified. What we have seen particularly within the banking sector in New Zealand uh, and the default providers, three of the big four banks have a huge range of their KiwiSaver offerings independently verified, as do a couple of the default KiwiSaver providers. They've not just got you know, one ethical fund, they've, they've really invested a huge amount of time in getting all of their funds up to certification level, and I think that trust that consumers are talking about when they're identifying it being important is, is probably rubbing off there a little bit as well. Yeah, no, that's helpful, um, and that, that makes makes sense to me. Um, Leah, just coming back to you, we you sort of touched on the complex touched on the your, um, sort of opening um, remarks, and there are obviously a lot of complex ethical issues that emerge. So I'm interested to just hear your perspectives of um, you know what's in your charter and what are the sort of things that are emerging from your perspective in this area. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. So, so um, for those that may not be aware, so Australian Ethical has been around for sort of uh, over three decades um, and always doing ethical investing. That's all we have always done. Um, so we have always considered a really broad group of stakeholders when we think about companies, uh, what they do, what they produce, but then also our investment decisions. And we we basically boil that down to three key pillars, which is people, planet and animals. Um, and hence, we've then built ethical frameworks around those pillars. Um, so things like human rights in terms of workers, First Nations people and supply chains um, on the people side, the environmental impacts um, of companies and their products and services, such as pollution, waste management, resource scarcity um, is, is really critical now and also carbon emissions. Um, and then on the animal side, animal welfare and industry, such as agriculture, live export, but also cosmetic and medical testing. So that's, I guess, the, the crux of our business and, and what we have been thinking about in years. But um, a couple of the things I wanted to point out um, is overall, we see climate urgency as the most critical issue facing all of those stakeholders. Um, so we have a, a much greater focus on that as a business than ever before. Um, we don't directly invest in coal, oil or gas. Um, instead, we do invest in clean energy. So um, New Zealand's famous renewable and gen retailers, so Meridian and Contact Energy are in our portfolios. Um, but also we've been spending the last couple of years in Australia um, putting a lot of pressure on insurance companies and banks to stop funding new fossil fuel projects and infrastructure. Um, and in fact, we were called out standing up at the latest um, NAB AGM um, around their climate commitment. So I think that the fact that we exclude, the fact that we take a much more positive approach to how we invest, but then also the fact that we're advocating and engaging with companies that we both invest in, but also maybe don't. Um, and then I thought it was, might be interesting for the audience just to sort of where we're evolving our ethical frameworks, because there's some, there's actually a lot of work that we're doing internally right now. And, and that's really reflective of changing responsible investing themes. It's where the market's moving, but also, um, I guess, changing social norms. So we update our ethical frameworks all the time. And I thought, there was three 
things um, I thought might be of interest to the audience, in particular, the divestment of some Australian companies that they're making from less than ethical parts of their portfolio. So in particular, Coles and Woolies. Um, so, you know, divesting out of alcohol and gambling um, directly, et cetera, that, that allows us to then review those companies um, and their, their new ethical credentials. So that's... Um, a changing sort of landscape for us. The impact of tra the transition that every company needs to undertake um, globally. So that impact of net zero targets um, means that particularly in Australia, where we're so resource and fossil fuel intensive as, as a market, um, that we're thinking about um, when will those companies become investable for us? You know, how much do they need to transition? Um, how clear are their commitments? Where are where's the science behind those commitments? Um, and in fact, what more can we do to help drive quicker and more urgent change um, in that transition? And then the final thing I would note um, is probably the biggest emerging theme right now for um, investments globally, um, and is far more complex than anything I think that we've mentioned today is biodiversity and natural capital. Um, and that's where we're sort of focusing a lot of our thinking at the moment. Thanks, Leah. That's really interesting. Um, and it sounds like you're quite ahead of the curve, um, which would be expected given your um, investment profile. But, um, and again, it sort of resonates with globally. I think there's been a real focus on the E of ESG um, and climate has been sort of the top of mind. Um, but we've had a lot more momentum in social and the G as well. Um, and just trying to have the resources to cover all of these things and how they interreact as um, interrelate is quite a huge challenge. So um, it's interesting to see how you've moved forward with that. So thanks, thanks for that update. Um, so just moving back to, to the panel here, um, Barry, I've got a question for you on um, just the general re results this year versus previous years or last year, for example. And what are your views or how, what, what would you say about some of the consistencies we've seen? between this year and last year on certain issues that, say, investors want to avoid um, now versus last year? Thank, thanks, Kirsten. And, and uh, I, I think the, the sort of that top-line result of saying that there is still rock-solid support for, for ethical investing uh, and the expectations of consumers of their providers will, will be ethical in their practices. That, that, for me, is, is really affirming given a downturn in the market. So, so, you know, above everything else, I think that's really an important result. Uh, another sort of thing that is not, is actually a departure from last year, and it's been happening over time, but that figure around impact investing, people who are interested, um, and the wording was around standalone impact investing funds, um, that increased by 11% over a year. I mean, and, and what we're seeing is we're seeing a whole move of the market, as, as Dean said, to not only say, there's a whole lot of stuff I don't want to invest in, so, so let me avoid harm, but actually I want to feel good about my investment. I, I want actually to have some aspirations for my portfolio of doing good things in the world. And it's, of course, in the context of also earning good financial returns. But it's, it's you know, and, and the data kind of disaggregates to make sure that, that people are saying, you know, they don't have to be top returns, but as you saw on the chart, they have to be comparable with, with the market. You know, they have to be industry standard returns. So, so what people are saying, you know, we, we want to feel good about our investments. So for me, that's, that's something which is a little bit different uh, from, from last year. And, and is really encouraging, it's been happening for a while. So now that we're, we're kind of starting to see this come in. Um, and, and I just wanted to make a final point. When, when John ran through the barriers, one of the barriers that we're finding, that we didn't actually ask about explicitly in the, in the survey, that we probably should do. But people are being told by their financial advisors, don't shift your fund. You know, when, when returns go down, whatever you do, don't shift your funds. And they don't provide the nuance to say, actually, if you're in a growth fund and you shift to another growth fund, that's fine, because your risk factors and your, and your asset allocation is in the same level. And that message gets dropped off from what people are hearing. So I think we're having a lot of consumers who are saying, oh, gee, I'm being told to stay in the fund that I'm in, rather than looking for a more ethical alternative. 
I, I, you know, worries me that that actually that nuance on the advice is not is not coming through. And, and I think uh, uh, I think those who are in the room who have a role in providing that advice and and uh, in the media, it's really it's really important to get that nuance across because. We want people to take informed decisions. We want them to be able to do so on the basis of sound information. And if they're shifting within the same risk category, that's also a fine, a sound financial decision. So, so uh, uh, it again didn't come up in the survey, but I think is underlying some of the perhaps less. If you look at the overall uh, data on switching, it has dropped since the markets dropped. And, and I think that's uh, a big reason why. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I think the um, I've got a couple of questions around financial advisors and some practical points um, to ask around that. But um, to your point, there's been a lot of surveys previously done, particularly on the retail investor market on um, investor preferences, and obviously clear disclosure is a sound commercial. Um, you know, there's a greenwashing point, but it is a sound commercial. Um, decision effectively because what we know of retail investors is they don't read long-winded prospectuses and details and disclosures. They tend to get their information from maybe the manager's website or some social bites on social media or from their financial advisors. Um, and when they're not getting that information or they don't understand it, they tend to disengage and they don't invest. They just don't. They just don't go through that process. And so the financial advisor has a really important role to play in explaining. Uh, these concepts to them and how it works, um, and that's like you know, part of a sort of ethical process um, that sits with the financial advisor to explain that. Um, so I think that's interesting that there is the sort of labelling um, point that's important because investors don't understand complex labels, but it is just sensible um, commercial um, decision making. Um, so just sort of coming back to greenwashing, because we've mentioned that a couple of times, and Dean, um, I have a question for you, because you seem to be quite um, excited about that. Um, what do you think, perhaps your best place to answer, what do you think, um, it's clear that obviously consumers are really concerned with greenwashing, um, and, and that being a potential uh, hazard. So what do you think that means for, in practical terms for the investment industry? Do you have any kind of views on that, and how that might be overcome? Yeah, excitement's probably not the right word, but yeah, um, certainly something that we spend a lot of time talking about, thinking about, um, and one, trying to resolve, but two, trying to understand, because I think the, the difficulty with greenwashing is that I think it comes in all manner of forms, and, and there's, there's some really overt greenwash out there that is totally, clearly misleading in terms of claims being made. There's then also, I think, you know, people that are trying to do their best, um, and and trying to navigate what is a really difficult, changing landscape. The, the reality of customer expectations is that they're different now than they were six months ago. The reality of uh, some of the guidance and even regulation is that it changes. And even when you get down to the, you know, if you get into the nitty gritty of even the, the, the weightings of portfolios, you know, an organization that yesterday was worth less than 10% of my portfolio might today be worth more. So, it, it really does evolve really quickly and, and changes all the time. I think the reality is what we're going to need to be able to do is get better at articulating when we're putting labels in our products, what do they mean, why are the labels there, and how are we proving that they're true. And when we're saying we're doing something positive, we're going to need to be able to say in a pretty clear way that a relatively average person could understand without having to read a 10-page document or spend 30 minutes understanding. When I say this is this is creating positive impact. How? How is it creating positive impact? Where is it creating positive impact? And what does that positive impact look like in real world terms so that I can get it in, in a really consumable way so that I don't have to sort of wade through the rubbish? Say what you do and do what you say and mm. make it simple. Yeah, agreed with that. Um, we were talking about financial advisors and their role, and I think I'd like to um, address the next question to you, Leah, um, just on what you're seeing. You're seeing um, because um, obviously consumers are expecting their financial advisors to be more knowledgeable in this area that was clear from those um, survey results. So just um, what your experiences are in Australia um, from that perspective would be great to hear. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. And I think I started out by saying that the the numbers are, are really interesting. They're quite similar uh, between the Australian and the New Zealand reports in terms of consumer demand and the expectations of advisors. Um, in addition to the REA report, we also sponsor an annual report by Investment Trends, and that is much more of a pulse check on the advice market and landscape and how they are um, interacting with consumers around um, responsible investing. And it's interesting from that report, um, sort of to go beyond just the expectation of advisors, there's, there's a group of consumers that are now investing a, um, in an ESG or responsible way or ethical way, but there's also this, um, this wave of investors, and we called it in the report, the next wave of investors that are looking to do something in the next 12 months. And it was interesting and overwhelming actually would be more inclined to seek advice from advisors. So I think it's reflective of the conversations that we've been having and the points that Dean's made already about, you know, the lack of um, the lack of taxonomy, the confusion around labels, the concerns about claims and greenwashing. We know that any investor, but in particular even high net worth investors, actually seek advice and third party validation where they don't feel comfortable or they don't feel confident in the options and 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 the credentials of what they're looking at. So. That's a really important thing I think we've already mentioned a couple of times today, that not only are they expecting advisors to, to be able to be knowledgeable and give advice in RI, but those that are looking to, to make the move in the next 12 months are more likely to seek that advice. And so advisors really do need to be on the front foot and need to be prepared for those conversations. Um, from an advisor perspective, um, from that investment trends report, we also know that advisors are increasingly embracing RI. So um, that report actually cited one in two advisors now providing advice in RI, and that's actually up from one in five a few years ago. So there's no doubt that this momentum we're seeing in um, consumer demand is driving um, advisors to embrace and to respond to, to, to res um, responsible and ethical investing. Um, and then I think the other part of the report which came out for any advisors that perhaps are in the room or online, um, that there's actually business benefits to embracing and engaging in RI. So those advisors that have actually made it part of their advice pro proposition and part of their process actually noted things like better client engagement, better client rapport, attracting more clients, retaining clients, um, and just overall enhancing their value proposition. So um, not only is there the, the impact that these dollars can make in the feel good factor for consumers, but there's obviously business benefits for advisors um, looking to embrace RI as well. Absolutely, I think that's a real at on this knowledge uh, point and um, before everyone it becomes overly mainstreamed I think that's a real opportunity now for um, advisors to bear in mind. Um, so just moving back to um, the panel here I have um, a general question just about um, those of us in financial services um, and perhaps John you can um, can answer this question because there'll be some who sort of still view this through a sort of business lens. Um, and I'm just wondering, those in, generally in financial services, what you think the survey tells us about the size of this market um, and opportunities there? Cool, thanks, Kirsten. Um, before I, before I um, before talk about the size of the market, I'll just clear one thing up. Um, Kirsten, when I was talking about um, barriers to entry and the difference in perception and reality, you, you said that I worked in sales. I haven't worked in sales. <laughs> I have raised to very fine young Gen Z, um, <laughs> and that makes me an expert on explaining the difference between perception and reality. <laughs> but we're talking about the, um, the size of the market. The size of the market. Firstly, um, what does the survey tell us? It tells us that the market is large, and I suppose more importantly that it's mainstream. Um, and what do I say? That I'll just quote two of the stats. 80% of people say they want to invest in ethical key saver if the returns were at least equal to mainstream. That tells us 80% of people when they realise the returns are the same unethical as mainstream, they will be switching. 73% of people say um, they will consider ethical investment in the next five years. So that's telling us they're not there yet, they are going to be there in the next five years. Um, so it sounds like the market is already large and growing. But the interesting thing for me as well is to flip it on its head and not think about who are the supporters of ROI, but think about the People who are really negative have a really negative view on responsible investing and ethical investing. And I think that's really insightful when you look at the survey 
10 percent of people or less would agree with one of these statements. Um, they would never <coughs> consider ethical investing. Ethical investing will perform worse in the long term. Um, you don't need to have impact on the real world through your investing. So 10 percent or less of people will agree with one of those statements. Um, I think that tells us that the demand for ethical product is greater than the demand for product that does not consider ethical investment. Um, it's which, you know, back to your question on size of market, from a pure business perspective, it tells us that the market is large and the market is going to continue to grow in the next five years. Right. And just to cont contextualise that, John, most of those people who are saying no are actually baby boomer men, proportionally. With apologies to anyone in the room who, who uh, were online who, who may fit that category. Um, and it's not to stereotype them to say that they have to behave like that. But as an observation, what we're seeing is a generational change. Uh, and, and I think that's really important because you know, the way that the market is going, you know, we, we're going to see further change happening in these statistics where there is a, a more receptive uh, population out there and as the intergenerational wealth is transferred, we're going to see some big changes. And, and that's a really interesting dynamic that, that we're looking forward to in the future. Um, Can we get some questions from the floor, please? Yeah, absolutely. That's my next um, thing to open up to the floor. I'm just conscious of time. So do we have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Shall we start with you since you've um, volunteered? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Susan Lyle from Fair and Good, and I really appreciate this uh, research. It really um, is useful to us. Um, my question is, following on from Barry, actually, uh, this um, difference between millennials and, and boomers, um, and I'm interested in real-world impact. Millennials seem to be a lot more open and positive, which is great, and boomers a lot more hesitant. But in terms of real impact in the real world, world not just in terms of numbers of investment, but amount of investment, how much do millennials actually invest compared with boomers? Because if there's a, if like, if like a minute, let's say millennials are 10% and boomers are 90%, well then, then it's actually going to be boomers, hesitant or not, that have the greatest real world impact. So is it actually better to focus on boomers if the, the, the amount of their investment is, is greater? I don't know the answer to if it is or isn't. Oh, my question? Yeah, that's a good question. Who's happy to so, <laughs> tackle so that? One of the things about the survey that's interesting, Susan, and, and uh, you know, more power to you for the great work that Fair and Good does, um, uh, is the, the, you know that chant about uh, things that people want to avoid? That's quite strong for boomers. Boomers really want to avoid stuff that is inconsistent with their values in their portfolios. And again, as I think I said, it's much stronger in New Zealand than Australia. And, and so that's an area where you, you do have a stronger um, uh, willingness to act from, from boomers around, around those dimensions. But I think the other answer to your question is maybe that is one of the reasons why there is still some hesitancy in the financial industry to make the shift towards more ethical and responsible investing and simply <coughs> into impact investing because there is still a remnant of the population who, who don't particularly support this. And, and as you say, often they are, they are the ones who have the most accumulated wealth. And, and so I think that that is a fact of the market. Um, but, you know, as we've been talking, it's changing over time. And, and I think we will see those changes uh, uh, come through over the forthcoming years. The wealth transfers we've been from the boomer generation to the millennials. Mm -hmm. yep. Is going to be moving that way. Yep. Hi, I'm going to Dean's uh, exciting uh, topic. Um, I've been reading about the phenomenon of green hushing. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, is that currently a problem in New Zealand or will it become more of a problem when you do have regulators and uh, litigants going after greenwashing? As we've already discussed, greenwashing is quite, it can be quite hard. That's why people know if they're doing it or not. So do you think green hushing issue or an issue to be? 
Uh, I think both, actually. I think, um, and I know for a fact that there are funds who are, uh, particularly in the Australian market, um, pulling back on some of the claims that they're making in response to, um, to some of the activity that's been going on. I think there's certainly a lot of organisations doing a lot of due diligence on their products uh, and, and on, their, um, on one the claims they're making, but even you know, some of the things they might have done or said historically. And I guess the reality is there's a good and a bad side to that, and we're just going to have to deal with that as we go through. Like, uh, the, the only way, the only thing that I think we can do is really focus on being really clear and articulate about what labels are, what they mean, and how they work, and that's going to make it much easier for a fund manager or an advisor or anybody to be able to draw that direct line so that they don't have to have that worry. But absolutely a problem now, and, and one that I imagine will, there'll be more of before there's less of, personally. Yeah. By green hushing, do you mean they're not talking or making claims around um, sustainability? Well, so yeah. lowering what they're doing. Yeah, well, lowering their communication around it. And, and I would say greenwashing is a sign of an immature market. It's a sign where the marketing department is running ahead of reality and what the investment team is doing. Green hushing is more a response to the regulators but in a, in a way it's a more mature market in the sense that they're still doing that investment, they're not just shouting it as much, but they're doing the investment. So it's, they're doing it but not shouting about it means the marketing team, they're not driving it anymore, the reality of better returns and having an impact on the planet is driving it. Um, so I, I would say that that's probably a normal response to a more mature market. Yeah. I think one of the other things, Rob, is the, uh, the way that compliance is done often by, by compliance agencies is to pick a particular example and go after that particular example and find them or take them to court, as we've seen in the US and Australia, and, and not so much in New Zealand yet. So, so the problem with that is that people are being challenged for misleading statements without the regulator actually saying, misleading with regard to what? What are the standards for ethical investment that you're measuring against? And that's particularly kind of concerning because then you get really into a green hushing approach because nobody quite knows who's going to get pinged and why. And, and it would be much better if you had uh, a, a decent regulatory system where the standards for, for what you can say about whether an investment is called sustainable or whether it's called impact are actually much clearer and there's much better disclosure, which has happened in the European Union. But it's not happening in New Zealand and many other markets. And I think it's, it's problematic from that perspective of green hushing because uh, people are now being reluctant to talk about the things that they do in a, uh, in a clear way. We, we probably have time just for one more question, um, just conscious of time. <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> um, with respect to impact investing, right, and say you got your, say you, you win. You get what you're after, and you woke up tomorrow and flows match the stated behaviour in the survey, right? With impact investing, have your organisations done any modelling or analysis on what impact that would have on asset prices? Well, I'll, I'll start by asking you to, how do you define impact investing? Well, because you, your survey, your, your guys' survey. Okay. So, so uh, impact to answer your question from a Pathfinder's perspective. So, impact investing is not necessarily investing in listed companies and because when you're buying stuff that's already listed you're not giving the money to the company you're giving it to somebody selling the shares you don't really get much real world impact it's hard to argue real world impact in listed securities so you're in the private asset space with impact you're investing in companies where you can measure both financial return and yeah. the real world impact um, it's a really hard space to operate in you're not going to see your portfolios end up there what i'd like to see is every for example in kiwi saver Every Kiwi Saver manager in New Zealand have one, two, three, four, five percent in the private asset space that have both the financial lens to make money, because that's our mission, but also measuring the impact of those investments. So it's not going to blow asset markets out of the market, you know, completely out of the water, um, but over time I think the impact space is really going to grow. But from a key, as a Kiwi Saver manager, we, we talk about duality of individual wealth and collective well-being. We're here to make money for people's future. Um, I have a social conscience, but I'm still a capitalist. So I'm here to make money, I just want to do it in a way that has a positive impact on the rest of the world, which is what the impact is. I might have a crack first and then hand it to you, I think. There's, and uh, like, uh, 
there's nothing I'd like less than to have a conversation about what is impact versus what is impactful and how. But I think the the important thing to think about at, at scale, the reality is there is impact investing, and then there is investing and having an impact and positive outcomes. And I think there's there are many ways. What you know, while you know, totally agree, it's listed equities in the impact investing space is a really difficult one to argue. There is also there are also a significant number of listed uh, of funds with listed equities that are having a massive impact on the world and that are creating positive outcomes through the way that they're purchasing those, through the engagement that they're um, having with organisations and through a lot of the actions that they're delivering on. Yes, I think there's, there's definitely a rationale that we need to get better at articulating what those are and how those are working. Um, but I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of positive outcomes that can come from a lot of the capital that's already deployed and allocated that needs to be voted and used in the right way. Just a very quick point. I think you're absolutely right. You, if you look at Meridian when they went onto a BlackRock ESG index, their funds flowed into to Meridian, their price jumped by 40%. So we're going to see a lot of that asset price inflation, but that's in a way signaling for cost of capital, that, that actually now their cost of capital is going to be lower because their share value is so much higher when they next do an issue. They, they are going to, to find a much lower cost of capital. It's the way kind of markets work, and I'd say get in there first and then you'll enjoy the rise in, in asset value. Okay. Um, Leah, do you have anything to add um, to that topic? No, I think not? everyone's covered. I, I would like to be repeating it, so I'm happy to hand you the time back. Absolutely. Thank you, Leah. Um, as much as we've got lots of questions here, I think we do need to keep to time. So. Um, Happy to wrap up now and just give some closing remarks. Um, and before I do that, um, just want to thanks to the organisers who made this hap um, happen today. Um, fascinating uh, survey and really telling of where we're at at the industry. Um, and I don't think some of these results were particularly surprising to see where we're at um, in New Zealand with um, consumer demands. Um, and it's clear to me, I think we need to obviously accelerate pro uh, progress here if we're going to be meeting these uh, sustainable investment um, industry standards to meet regulatory developments and most importantly to meet these consumer demands. <clears throat> and I think, you know, obviously these sorts of forums and surveys are extremely interesting, um, the food for thought and we can continue to have these surveys and talk on these panels and share our learnings but the real work is done once the conversation ends and we uh, leave the discussion and put these thoughts and um, learnings into action. Um, I've attended quite a lot of these industry events overseas and this is my first um, New Zealand one so it's been really fascinating for me and one of the things that always comes out of these discussions is just how thoughtful and pragmatic this industry is um, but it really needs to be. Um, I, I think that firms are becoming more and more aware of um, you know, capital is important it's, but it's not just about getting capital, it is about deep um, impact and being part of these discussions and engaging is a very important part of that process. Um, so it's great to just see how this, um, the momentum's being picked up broadly in, in the industry here as well. Um, so more capital, more investors, more client awareness, more impact and more action is the direction of travel um, that I'm seeing. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to conclude um, today's discussion. Uh, thanks again for everyone coming today, and I'll hand it back to Barry uh, for any final comments. Thanks. Thanks very much to, to Kirsten for, for facilitating the panel and to Dashana for the introduction, and to Leah for joining us uh, online. It becomes sometimes difficult being, being online when... Uh, when you've got a, a, an in-person panel. And thanks very much to John Barry for, for wise words, as always. Um, uh, I just wanted to say a shout out to the uh, data provider for, for the survey, Donator. I think they've done a really good job. Uh, and, uh, but particularly to my colleague, Olive, uh, Olive Coulson, who has done a lot of the hard work in taking the report through design, helping out in so many different ways, setting up the seminar, uh, and uh, as well as working with Charlotte from KPMG. So, Olive, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really, really great. And uh, um, thank you all for coming.
do you want to say a final word? Uh, look, just a couple more thank yous, really. First of all, um, on behalf of RIA, thank you to Mindful Money for the amazing work that they're doing um, on the ground, but also for the assistance in terms of pulling the report together. Uh, there is always a huge amount of work that goes into uh, making a report and lots of last minute changes and rearrangements that, uh, that always make life interesting. Um, and then just a big thank you to those of you who have come and engaged in this conversation. Um, apologies we didn't get a chance to get to more of those questions. Totally happy afterwards to kind of hang around and take any of those or by all means feel free to, uh, to send them through to us. I think it's, it's clearly, this is an ongoing conversation. This is annual research that we do every year that is designed to I think understand how the market is shifting and so the more feedback we're able to get from you about what parts are useful, what other insights you'd like to get, the easier that is for us to be able to deliver what you want. Thank you.